One Piece is hitting all the right spots right now. I mean, my god, Oda, what are you doing to me? Those of you who know me know that I am an absolute history nerd. I especially love ancient history. I also love ancient mythology. And Elbaf is just tickling me silly with all of these allusions to all of these ancient cultures, all of these ancient mythologies. I've honestly been on such a high just listening to so much and reading up on so many of these ancient myths and folktales. And the revelations in chapter 1128 were no different. It sent me off to research all of the different types of solar deities in ancient traditions. And I have to say, I think we may be onto something here. And I hope you guys are enjoying this history and these mythological deep dives as much as I am. Or at least I hope that my enthusiasm is rubbing off on you because it seems like Elbaf. And you know what? Actually, scratch that. It seems like the rest of the series is going to be chock block full of references to historical myths and real life mythological illusions. So you need to get on board and you need to get on board fast. But I do think today's ramblings will interest you because I think that I now understand what might be the connection between all of the D-Clan members or at least all of Joy Boy's allies and it has to do with the Sun God. And we're going to discuss all of that together, all of these connections. But you know what? Before we do, there's another connection that is very important and that's the connection between you and I. And do you know what connects all of us together? It's our shared love for One Piece and it's our shared love for clicking the subscribe button. Please subscribe to my video so that you and I can be bonded. A very special bond for the love of One Piece. A sacred bond that also means you get to hear more of my One Piece discussions. Because who doesn't want more of that? Okay, so chapter 1128 reveals the existence of an actual sun god deity in Elbaf, which was somewhat surprising and somewhat not. Mainly because we have always known that Elbaf does revere and worship sun deities in some way or another. This isn't new, we knew it all the way back from Big Mom's flashback when we saw that the Elbafians observed the winter solstice. So we knew that there was some sort of festival, a celebration of the sun. And then of course in Egghead Island this was further expanded upon when Dory and Brogy first arrived at Egghead Island and they recognize Luffy as sun god Nika. And even in Vegapunk's message, Vegapunk refers to Nika as the sun god spoken of in Elbaf legend. And I think that meant we all assumed that Elbaf had knowledge of and even worshipped sun god Nika. Or at least I assumed. I assumed that Elbafians knew of sun god Nika and worshipped sun god Nika. Whereas now, it seems like Elbafians have a sun god of their own a distinct sun god that is separate from sun god Nika. And that seems to be paradoxical, right? I mean, we've got two paradoxical facts here. One is the fact that they definitely do know of sun god Nika. That's based off Dory and Brogy's dialogue as well as Vegapunk's message. But here, we now also know they have their own separate sun god. So I was really pondering about this since reading chapter 1128. And the logical conclusion that I came away with is that Elbafians, much like ancient traditions or ancient peoples and civilizations that existed in our real world, ancient civilizations who had paganistic religions, polytheistic religions, meaning they worshipped more than one god, in a lot of ancient cultures, people believed in multiple iterations, multiple versions of solar-based deities. But what was really interesting to find out was that more so than this being a a common feature of Norse culture and Norse mythology, which of course is the most obvious place to look to first because Elbaf seems to be otherwise very heavily inspired by Nordic culture. But this existence and this belief in multiple sun gods is actually characteristic of other cultures and other religions. And probably the most notable that I came across was ancient Egyptian religion. So I got stuck down a whole rabbit hole of researching different Egyptian gods, different Egyptian sun gods and then I had to stop myself because you know Egypt is the basis for Arabasta and not for Elbaf and then I had a bit of an aha moment where I went hang on maybe this is all connected so to borrow words from Usopp from chapter 1128 this is where I'm at what if all of Joy Boy's allies what if all of Joy Boy's followers are connected through their shared belief in a sun god now that we know Elbaf 
Elbathians actually definitely have a sun god of their own. And that sun god seems to be a pretty important deity to Elbathians as well. I mean, look at how much the citizens revere the sun god in chapter 1128. Although maybe you can't actually take the worship and the reverence of these characters from chapter 1128 from face value because they seem to, I don't know, I guess you could say that they actually have a case of Stockholm Syndrome because they all seem to be unwittingly victims, unwittingly captive of this false RPG world that the Sun God has created. But even aside from these characters in chapter 1128, like I said, we've seen before that every year the Elbafians observe the winter solstice. They celebrate the sun, they worship a sun deity. And then this got me thinking because this isn't the first time or this isn't the only time where we've seen references to a sun god that doesn't necessarily or hasn't necessarily been confirmed to be about Nika. And the one that I'm talking about is back from the Skypiea arc. Remember back in Skypiea, the Shandorians, they also worshipped a sun god, albeit it was alongside some other gods like the rain god and the earth god and the forest god. But the priest prayed to the sun god first, almost as if the sun god is the most important. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the fact that the Shandorians also seem to be a civilization that exists in One Piece that seems to be heavily inspired by a real-life ancient civilization. It seems like the Shandorians were very much influenced by the Mayan civilization. And the Mayans also had their own pagan religion featuring their own solar deity. Not to mention the fact that it was also back in the Skypiea arc where we saw Luffy doing that classic Joy Boy Gear 5 Nika dance. So then I started thinking about all the other races, all the other special families that we have, especially those connected to Joy Boy. And this made me think of Arabasta first because again, I told you I went down a deep rabbit hole looking at Egyptian culture and I thought, What's to say that Arabasta don't have their own solar deity, especially when you consider the huge significance of sun gods in Egypt? Like I said, in comparison to Norse mythology, Egypt actually has multiple sun gods, and sun gods also seem to be a lot more important in Egypt because the sun god seems to be a seems to be the head of the gods. They're the heads of the pantheon. For example, the sun god Re or Ra, Ra was considered the head god of the Egyptian Egyptian pantheon. And Ra has also taken on multiple iterations throughout the ages. It seems to be a common quirk in Egyptian religion that gods would somehow take on different qualities or would be merged with other gods. Their names change throughout history. And so this sun god in Egypt plays much more of a significant role than the sun goddess of Norse culture, Sol, plays in Norse culture. So then I was thinking maybe this means we're going to see a sun god in Arabasta. Or you could even argue that we have through the Nefertari family itself because of the meaning of Nefertari. So this name, Nefertari, actually exists in our real life history. Nefertari is the name of of a very famous Egyptian queen. Queen Nefertari was the wife of Ramses II. And Ramses literally means born of Ra or born of Re. And again, Re or Ra is the sun god, the principal sun god. So if you think about it, you could say that we actually do have a manifestation or a representation of a sun god in Arabasta already through the royal family. Especially when you consider how religion seems to work in the Arabasta kingdom, the title of god seems to be bestowed upon those who have connections to the royal family. For example, Pell and Chakra were called the guardian gods. Pell and Chakra seems to be heavily influenced by Egyptian deities. Hell's falcon form in particular actually could be related to Horus, the falcon god of the sky according to Egyptian legend. And as I mentioned before, because of different gods merging in different points in history, this god Horus is actually known to be connected to the god Re or Ra, and Ra and Horus were merged to form a super god called Rei Horakti. So then I started thinking about it and we've got a sun god in Elbaf, we have a sun god in Shandoria, and a representation of a sun god in Arabasta. So why stop there? Why not think about all the other special races? Which led me to think about the Fishmen as another one of the major allies of Joy Boy. And again at Fishmen, similar to Arabasta, we have a case where those of the royal family seem to be connected to deities in our real life. 
life. Especially deities of the sea, which makes sense because the fishmen are an underwater civilization. So we've got King Neptune, and Neptune is the name of the Roman god of the sea, whereas Otohime seems to be the name of the daughter of the Japanese sea god called Ryujin. And then of course Shirohoshi, who is also known as Poseidon, or the physical manifestation of Poseidon, and Poseidon is the Greek god of the sea. So that's the sea gods, how about the sun? Well, although it doesn't seem like we have have a sun god per se in Fishman Island, the sun is still obviously a very central theme for the Fishman. The main storyline that concerns the Fishman is their desire, is their wish to live on the surface so that they can get direct sunlight. You know, one of the most notable crew to emerge from the Fishman are the sun pirates, and then all of the other pirate crews that have emerged from Fishman are somehow related to the sun pirates. Sun obviously being the key word there. And you could even argue that Sunlight Tree Eve almost plays a deity-like element. Maybe you think I'm stretching it too far, but of course I'm not actually saying Sunlight Tree Eve is like a god itself, but it's a tree that has very significant meaning for the fishmen. You know, it's something they rely on, it's something they depend on, it's something that they're very grateful towards. It's even said that this underwater civilization can survive through the light that emanates through the Sunlight Tree Eve. So even if it's not technically a deity, you could say that it plays like a super important role in their lives, almost like a religion. And what I'm getting at is that the sun and this idea of sun god, sun deities, this could be the link. You know, maybe we're gonna find out that belief in a solar deity or belief in solar deities, plural, this belief is a common feature in special groups, special races, special species, and in particular, the ones that have a special connection to Joy Boy. You know, this could have been the foundation that made people follow Joy Boy, especially when Joy Boy became a sun god in his own right, when he became sun god Nick this could have been what made his allies believe in him. I mean, can you imagine if this is what caused Nefertari Lily to betray the other 20 kingdoms to side with Joy Boy instead? You know, maybe she felt that by siding with Joy Boy, she was doing the work of God. She's doing the work of the Sun God. And then I started thinking, Maybe this isn't even limited to just the followers or allies of Joy Boy. Maybe this is what connects all the D-Clan members. Maybe there's a reason why Blackbeard or people from Blackbeard's race can't sleep at night. It has something to do with the sun. Maybe it's a relationship between Blackbeard's race and the sun god. Maybe they were cursed by the sun god, for example. Maybe they defied the sun god at some point. Or let's take the Monkey D family, for example. Fans have long pointed out out that the Monkey King, which is a religious figure from a popular Chinese novel from the 16th century, a novel called Journey to the West, fans have long pointed out that this Monkey King seems to have inspired Oda greatly in developing Luffy's character, and it just so happens that this Monkey King is named Sun Wukong. So that's another connection between the D-Clan and the Sun for you. And look, I haven't found connections for all the D-Clan members yet, but if we look at Clover, which is the the latest person to be a confirmed D-Clan member. Cleave D Clover, Cloudy Clover, Cloud Clover, whichever way you choose to pronounce his name, doesn't matter. Either way, Clover's character seems to be heavily inspired by Irish culture, Irish culture and traditions, and we know that given Irish are traditionally Celtic. It just so happens that there is also a Celtic sun god. The Celtic sun god's name is Luke. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that, but Luke happens to be one of the most beloved heroes in Irish folktale or in Celtic folklore. And what was really interesting was that Celtic folklore also features a deity who has antlers. So this deity is named Sonunos. And again, I'm really sorry for mispronouncing everything in this discussion. And while this god isn't directly related to the sun, it does seem like he embodies strong connections to nature, fertility, animals, and life force. And so I guess you could argue that this means that he is symbolically linked to the idea of sun's life-giving properties. And I just bring this up because Sonunos was the first god that came up when I tried searching up 
a sun god who also has antlers. Obviously because of the antlers and the sun god figure that we saw in chapter 1128. Anyways, like I said, I haven't been able to come up with connections for all the D-Clan members yet. So if you know more, for example, if you have connections between Goldie Roger to the Sun or Portgas and so on and so forth, please do let me know. But in the meantime, a more general connection that I suppose could relate to all the D-Clan members could be the shape of the D itself. You know, rather than the D standing for a word, it could just be a symbol. Because obviously the D looks like half a circle, so you could say that the D looks like half a sun. Or more specifically, if you rotate the D 90 degrees to the left, I think I got that mathematically correct. If you rotate it, you could argue that the D looks like the sun or like a sunrise that's appearing over the horizon. Or you could even say that it represents the sun setting and the sunrise could represent members of the D clan like Luffy, like Roger, whereas the sunset could represent the darker forces of the D clan like Blackbeard or like Roxy's effect. And that's also very interesting because in a lot of ancient cultures, in a lot of ancient mythologies, there does seem to be a lot of stuff that has to do with the different stages of the sun. There's a lot of meaning about the sun setting versus the sun rising, about the, you know, the sun dying or, or the solar cycle. And this could all be represented through the different types of D-Clan members. Anyways, if we're right about this, or if we're at least on the right track, then I think this is very interesting because it sheds a whole new light or it recontextualizes the entire idea of the D-Clan being the enemy of the gods. You know, that statement would actually be totally wrong. It would be totally ironic because rather than the D clan being the enemy of the gods, they're actually the believer of the gods. They're the believers of the true god because the celestial dragons are false gods and the D clan members are manifestations or are representations and deeply connected to sun gods. So then going down this thought train also started making me wonder if there are multiple sun gods that exist in the One Piece world, why is sun god Nika so special? What makes Nika so important? Especially because it even seems like the world government may excuse people's belief in a sun god God, so long as it's not Sun God Nika. I mean, for example, Elbaf hasn't come under the attack by the world government yet, or as far as we know. And to be fair, I guess you could argue that the world government would be way too scared to try and attack Warland Elbaf, the Elbaf that is affiliated with Shanks, the Elbaf that is the home to warrior giants. But let's even take the God's Knight figure, for example. Now, I do want to premise this discussion with the full disclaimer that everything that I'm going to to say now is obviously unconfirmed or unconfirmed at this point but I'm sure we've all noticed that the mask that the figure in chapter 1128 is wearing seems awfully similar to the one that the god's knight was wearing during Kuma's flashback and obviously this raises some questions. Now the first question is actually whether both these figures are actually wearing a mask and this isn't actually just their heads but let's just assume that they are because that's what it seems like and if we also assume that the masks are the same, you'd have to wonder why is that God's Knight wearing that mask? You know, does he know of the Sun God? Does he revere the Sun God of Elbaf? You know, maybe that mask is supposed to be somewhat like a good luck charm, some sort of religious talisman. You know, similar to how people of the Catholic religion carry around rosary beads, for example, especially as a knight or warrior. It could be a religious talisman that they keep in the belief it's going to keep them safe and it's going to give them strength strength because that's quite common across cultures. For example, even if you look at Viking culture, Viking culture also being a very combat heavy culture similar to the God's Knights or sort of similar to the God's Knights, many Vikings used to wear Thor's hammer as a pendant, sort of as a prayer, sort of as a mark or a symbol to keep them safe, to give them strength. So maybe that's what we were seeing there with the God's Knight wearing the mask of the sun god of Elbaf as a sign of respect, as a sign, as a means of prayer, asking the sun god to give him strength and to keep him safe given he is a God's Knight member, therefore a warrior, therefore someone who has to fight a lot. Which then goes back to my original question of why would the world government allow the God's Knight member 
to wear a symbol of a sun god? Is it because the world government only outlaws sun god Nika? And is that because sun god Nika was the head of all the gods? Is sun god Nika the head of all the sun gods? Similar to, like I said, going back to ancient Egypt, Amun-Ra or Amun-Re was considered the head god of all the deities, including all the sun god deities. You know, maybe it was sun god Nika who had the most power, maybe he could spur all the other gods into action. Maybe Sun God Nika is able to bestow special abilities on other people, bestow special abilities on other gods, which is similar or which is what seemed like was happening between Luffy and Bonnie. And I do have a whole video discussing that very topic about Nika, about how Nika seems to be able to grant people special abilities, and that this is why the world government decided to persecute the Buccaneers so heavily for their belief in Nika. And I highly recommend you to go watch that video if you haven't already but for the purposes of today's discussion now I think I might have spiraled a little bit too deep here so let's bring this back a little bit because I guess an easier answer I guess a more straightforward thought train would be that both these figures both the sun god and the god's knight member these masks aren't necessarily a symbol of the sun god, they could just be a symbol of strength. You know, maybe it doesn't have to relate to the gods or to the sun god specifically, they both just chosen these antlered masks because antlers also have a very specific meaning. In many cultures in our real world, antlers have a huge symbolic role. Across the various cultures, it actually seems to have a very similar meaning. Antlers seem to mean the cycle of life. It means an untamed, wild nature. And I guess even then, you could argue that those are almost metaphors for divinity and metaphors for gods, because gods are typically the source of life in religion. You know, they give life to humans, they control the lives of humans and of all other creatures. And you could also argue that gods are untamed, they're uncontrollable, they're wild, because they obviously can't be tamed. They can't be tamed by humans because they stand above us. So then I started looking more at stags and antlers, and in particular their connection or their meaning in Norse mythology. And although I couldn't find any stag gods or any deer gods per se, I did definitely find that stags do play a very important role in Norse mythology. And so the two most relevant I found is first the Ekthenir. Ekthenir? Ekthenir? Look, again, so sorry, but Ekthenir. Ekthenir is the name of a stag in Norse mythology, and this stag is said to stand on the roof of Valhalla. And Valhalla is the Great Hall, it's one of the realms where Odin receives fallen warriors. And this stag's antlers are said to drip water, and this water is said to flow into the well called Helmigir, and this well feeds into all the rivers of the world. And in this way, this symbolizes that this stag and the stag's antlers have life-giving properties. It's supposed to represent the natural cycles of the cosmos, it's supposed to represent fertility and the cycle of life or the flow of life. The other important stag is actually a group of four stags, and you know what, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce their names. But this group of stags, they're said to live in the branches of Yggdrasil, the world tree, and these stags are supposed to symbolize the connection between the natural world and the cosmos because they live in in the branches of Yggdrasil, and Yggdrasil is supposed to represent the axis of the universe. So again, these stags also represent vitality, nature, the cycle of life, and their antlers are supposed to connect them to the tree's divine energy. Meaning that in both these two examples, stags and antlers seem to represent life and divinity, which is what I was saying that stags seem to be in a roundabout way represent the nature of gods. And so I guess in that sense, it does make sense as to why Oda would have chosen to give this Elbafian sun god antlers. In both of these examples, these stags of Norse mythology, they seem to stand at the precipice, at the margins, or the border. They stand at the border of the different realms that exist in Norse mythology. In the first example, the stag stands at the border, at the gate of Valhalla. And in the second example, these stags are supposed to symbolize the connection between the natural world and the cosmos. The stags represent the gateway between worlds or between 
realms, which is very fitting because in chapter 1128, we were introduced to this idea of the separate realms. You know, we have the real world where the giants actually seem to live, and then we have this fake Lego world, and it seems that this sun god of Elbar, he seems to control who goes in and who goes out. So again, very fitting, very interesting, and this is where my head's been at, but I'd love to know what you think, especially about my sun god idea. What do you think about the existence of multiple sun gods, a sun god existing for each of Joy Boy's allies, potentially each of the D-Clan members? If you know of any further connections between the D-Clan and real life mythology, especially for the ones that I haven't been able to come up with connections for yet, let me know by leaving a comment below. Or even if you are thinking about this Elbafian sun god from a completely different perspective, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the idea, so let me know in a comment below. But as always, thank you for listening to another one of my crazy ramblings. If you're not already, please do subscribe because we have so many more One Piece ideas to discuss. You can also support the channel further by becoming a Patreon or channel member like these wonderful people. And thank you to our executive officers for your continued support. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.